Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Welcome guys to another Vaccination Data Seminar series. We're excited today to have Vishaka Gupta. Um, Vishaka is uh, the co-founder and CEO of Aperture Data, which is the, the, the main company backing Aperture DB. Uh, so I've known Vishaka for several years. I first met her uh, when she was a researcher at Intel Labs, um, you know, working in the database space. And before joining Intel Labs, she did her PhD at Georgia Tech, and she's also a CMU alum. So Vishaka, thank you so, thank you so much for being here. Um, for the audience, if you have any questions for Vishaka as she's speaking, just unmute yourself and ask your question anytime. We want, we want this to be a conversation and not just have her talking to herself for now. So with that, Vishaka, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, it's great to be back at CMU, even if it's virtually. Uh, so thanks, Andy, for arranging that. And thank you all for being uh, online today. Um, let's just get started. So images and videos or visual data is special. And I know you will say, well, of course, you're, you know, your company based on that. So you're going to say that. But it is special because it's rich in information. Data science and machine learning techniques in the last decade have really helped companies from various domains like smart retail, smart agriculture, medical imaging, understand visual content and enable better customer experience, which gives them a competitive edge if they can use it right. Naturally, this has led to a rapid increase in the amount of visual data that is now accessed a lot more frequently and needs to be managed. So a valid follow-up then is, do we know how to deal with it and well, because images and videos can be individually large. Sometimes we've come across medical imaging use cases where an, one image is two gigabyte large. And typically they also occur in large volumes. You have millions or sometimes billions of images and videos that you have to deal with. Another uh, unique aspect of this type of data is that the transforms on visual data are also unique. If we are thinking databases, they typically tend to they typically tend to support operations like sum or average, which lose meaning when you're talking about visual data. The equivalent and common operations would be pre-processing tasks like resize, crop, rotate, maybe sample videos uh, that can be performed on images, frames, or the videos themselves. As common as these are across applications, they can also be quite computationally expensive. So the complexity of operations that we are talking about or transformations is unique in this case. Visual data is also um, typically accompanied by a lot of metadata because the metadata doesn't just contain information about the visual object itself, like the file name or the size of the image, but it's also, it also describes uh, more about the surrounding application. Like where did that data come from? What are the annotations in it? What are the features describing the content and so on? So to see if we have a handle on this, let's start with an example. Imagine you're a data scientist or a machine learning engineer who has to train a model to detect thousands of new classes of objects and train with hundreds of thousands of new images that you've just received in some cloud bucket. So let's, I wanna show you a quick example of, you know, just some example, just think about, um, you know, someone who is trying to understand the data and use it, what are the steps they have to get, go through before they can actually do that job? So if you're working in a big company, for example, this is typical uh, in, the, in such cases, you'll first have to find, okay, where, which is the right database and table to use from which I can query my metadata. Now, uh, then you go get permission to access said database and table. Now you have to make sure that you allocate large enough virtual machine for yourself to be able to download all this information and run your training models. And let's say uh, that the data was actually stored in a Postgres table. So this is just a sample query and it's not exactly matching any particular use case, but this is something we wrote for another paper from which I'll use the numbers. You first have to go perform all the joins, access all the tables, and get URLs to the images that you're gonna to use to train your models. So that's step one, after all the setup, now you get the metadata. Now you finally have URLs because the metadata pointed to the URL in some cloud bucket. And so now you get permission to, and now you have to go get permission to download them. So you get the metadata, you download the images. Now let's say your model expects 224 by 224 pixel. So now you have to resize the original images, which could be 
any size 1K, 4K resolutions. So now you have to bring in some OpenCV type library, implement your resize rotate functions, and now you're finally ready to train or classify or whatever it is your original task was. Now let's see what that can look like with Aperture DB. You literally get access to the Python client, connect to the server, then put your constraints. In this case, I have a very simple constraint, but you could put constraints like all images with horse in it, all images with dogs in it. In this case, I'm just querying for all images of a particular license. You create a data set. Let's say you're using PyTorch for training and that's it. You query it, you have 120,000 images. You can just check what's in a particular image and you run a classifier and it quickly tells you that it shows a ball player and a baseball player in this case. So that's as easy as it was to create that training or classification pipeline with Aperture DB. That's the transition we wanted to bring about when we encountered the data management status quo for the first time when Intel launched their Science Technology Center around Visual Cloud. My co-founder, Luis, and I were at Intel back then, and we started working with machine learning researchers from Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, building uh, frameworks to detect and understand content in, in videos that they were collecting. We were honestly very excited to get a chance to learn from the latest and greatest in computer vision, deep learning. But what we ended up spending most of our time was managing these videos and the application information, because there just weren't existing tools or databases that could take uh, that we could just um, download and use for this complex unstructured data. The more we looked around, the more we noticed data infrastructure being hard on a lot of other teams of data scientists and machine learning engineers trying to use images and videos. We could also see that this data was just growing so rapidly and an explosion coming in the quantities in so many different domains. So it made sense for us to solve this problem solve it well for people beyond just our team at the time. That's basically what led us to spin out Aperture Data. Since computer vision, so for today's talk, um, since computer vision and machine learning workloads or use cases are relatively new, after motiv motivating the problem and what Aperture DB can do, I'll briefly describe what our users and their use cases look like. We will then spend most of the time in the design decisions we made as we built this database, how that ties to the performance uh, we see, and close with our next steps. So coming back to why we believe data management platforms are not designed for images or video-based machine learning analytics. After hundreds of conversations, so ever since leaving Intel to do this company, uh, We've had hundreds of conversations with data scientists, senior data scientists, machine learning engineers across different companies in different domains. What we have learned is how complex the landscape is for dealing with images and videos for this application. Because dealing with visual data types means a lot more than just image video files. It means multiple data types like application metadata, annotations. Sometimes there are n-dimensional embeddings. Not only do you have to deal with different types of data, but your current option is to deal with these data types in different products that address those types. Of course, the lack of interoperability among them means you have to translate, which hurts performance, and worse, it makes data lifecycle management quite painful because now you have to ensure the data that you insert is consistent across these various products. Beyond managing the data, Pulling the right data out of various systems leads to long engineering delays and requires conversions and processing to feed into your machine learning application layers. It can also make data science teams reluctant to keep refreshing their data sets or changing metadata schema due to the fear of taking more time away from actually understanding the data and being productive. Last point I wanna drive here is that creating point solutions on a need basis, which is what today most people end up doing, it also means lack of reuse, which further prolongs delivery of their business objectives. And in all of this, we haven't even talked about the orchestration components to instantiate all of this, or the components to authenticate and uh, control access to the different um, sets of data. Now to um, 
I want to use a classic development sequence to really paint a picture of how these, what we call DIY or do-it-yourself systems evolve and become extremely messy over time. As you want to transform your input data into useful outputs, like let's say you're trying to suggest some recommendations or you're training models to deploy or just display data to users. So you start with just receiving different types of data, like you have images and metadata, you might have videos, you might have annotations. Naturally, that goes to storage buckets and some choice of databases. And the choices depend on who is implementing the, the solution at the time. Very often, you need label data for training models. That means now you bring manual or automatic labelers that need access to these uh, data sets. And then you have to take the annotations that they provide in whichever format they are in and find a way to land them. Sometimes they go in cloud buckets uh, where they are not searchable, or sometimes people transform them in and store them in a database so you can use them later. After all this is when the DIY scripts come into picture, which bring data together and return a data set to a machine learning framework or a front end to display. Um, sometimes any of these steps can require pre-processing or augmenting the original data for various reasons. Like it might be because your neural network expects it, or you might need thumbnails just because it's easier to display. And then finally, in some cases, if you're building recommendations or you need to find similar looking objects, not using keywords, but actually using content, which is fairly common, you have to address the indexing of high dimensional visual feature vectors and then support K near neighbor and similarity searches. So what that ends up looking like is a complex glued together system that is brittle and painful to maintain and reuse. Not really an eloquent way or efficient way to solve this. And imagine what this looks like when you add multiple use cases and users and you keep scaling your data. So really what people have been wanting is a single unified approach for dealing with all these types of data. If you could have a unified holistic purpose-built system to do all that, it would mean enhanced productivity with simplified data engineering and much faster ways to iterate on machine learning rather than spending a lot of time on data infrastructure. A system like that would also be able to evolve rapidly as machine learning evolves because new machine learning methods mean you can extract more information, which means you've got to go update your original data with uh, richer uh, metadata. And such a system, would also be able to scale as rapidly as the data grows without, and all of this without disturbing any of the user pipelines. That's what we offer with Aperture DB. It's a purpose-built uh, visual data management system for analytics. Aperture DB natively supports management of images and videos. Given the range of usages for this data, we provide necessary pre-processing operations like zoom, crop, sampling, creating thumbnails as you are accessing this data or storing it into Aperture DB. Now, given how key metadata is to finding the right subset of your data, we manage application metadata as a knowledge graph, which also helps us capture internal relationships between the metadata and data and enable quite complex visual searches. Given we were always targeting machine learning applications, we also support bounding boxes for labeling so that you can do annotation-based searches using this metadata graph. Since feature vectors are representations of the content in images or frames, they make it possible to find visually similar objects. That's why we also offer similarity search using feature vectors. Now, one of the important goals we had was that we did not want our users to have to deal with multiple systems. So that's why Aperture DB uses a query engine or an orchestrator uh, to redirect user queries to, these, to the right component, collect the results to return a coherent response to the user, and it exposes a unified JSON-based native API to all the machine learning pipelines and end users. Now these pipelines or users can execute queries that can add, modify, search, visual data and metadata, annotations of feature vectors. You can perform on the fly visual pre-processing and you can do more machine learning tasks. Like let's say you wanna create a snapshot of data that you trained a particular model on. These are the kind of things that you can then use Aperture DB for. Now in the previous slide, we talked about how Aperture DB manages the data and metadata. It can actually store and access this data 
from cloud buckets or storage managed by AppetitDB itself. Um, we also provide uh, C++ and Python client packages to access the AppetitDB server, since most of our users prefer those languages when building their applications. And of course, you know, we provide a good set of additional tools to simplify integrating in the user's ecosystem. For example, to ingest data into Aperture DB, we provide fast concurrent uh, loaders that just expect simple comma separated files with metadata and data files that can either be local or you can provide us with URLs. We make it really easy to ingest data into Aperture DB. We also have data set loaders, the, the previous example I showed in the notebook for machine learning frameworks like PyTorch where our loaders hide the complexity of fetching training or classification data in batches, and users just need to specify a filter for what data they want to train on. And then behind the scenes, we take care of when the next batch should be fetched and how it, uh, it can be used by, the, by any ML framework. Now, we also offer REST API that is used by our web front end, but can easily be used by any labeling frameworks or just you know, your in-house um, web UI that you might have. And then to support enterprise deployments, we also offer um, authentication, role-based access control, we support audit logging, and we support monitoring. All these are things like, you know, as you move to production deployment, you kind of need all these things to work. Um, I wanted to bring this picture again to show you how a purpose-built system can really simplify your data pipelines and then allow you to focus on the machine learning and data understanding that is actually the primary objective of data scientists and ML engineers. Uh, there sure are additional benefits beyond the productivity boost, such as performance. Before we dive into the components uh, and the design decisions we have made and look at performance, I wanted to I wanted to talk about some of the benefits to various user types that we have come across, just to give an idea of who benefits and why they need something like this. So all this work um, and the design decisions we've made, they've been driven by who we want to help. So to lay it out more concretely with AppertureDB, data scientists can move faster when model tuning and deployment, doing any searches for data in order to build use cases like if they want to do classification, object detection, if they are trying to do activity recognition or just building something to recommend what, what to see next or what, to, uh, what product to buy. So data scientists and ML engineers clearly benefit from this. There are also other key personas that can really benefit. For example, there are infrastructure teams who now have to maintain one system as opposed to five that they had to maintain before. Then there are data engineers. For them, now they have simpler time managing life cycle of data because everything is taken care of by Aperture DB internally. There are also, you know, because there's a common visual repository that all data scientists can now work off of, data science managers can see more team collaborations and faster results. And then there are also some important SRE style requirements that we take care of in terms of, you know, security, privacy, monitoring, reliability, and availability. And for anyone wondering how much do companies really care about this, the visual intelligence team at a major home improvement retailer was really concerned about the loss of productivity because their uh, complex DIY setup would cause days of delays each time you started doing some new, uh, you started building up some new pipeline or training some new model. So now we are managing millions of images and product information and annotations for them. And in fact, they are expanding to start using our um, embeddings support to do similarity search and build their recommendations pipeline on top of Aperture DB. We have worked with a use case from a camera intelligence team around label management for frames, grab from retail cameras. There's also a healthcare use case around how much you can attach any, any n-dimensional embeddings to document images and then search using the similarity search functionality. So now that we know the why, why now, who and how, it's a great time to switch gears into some of the design choices we have made over the course of developing this database and its unique API. We had already established metadata was important and would be the key to finding the right data subsets in most common queries. So the natural question was, how do we store it or model it? We looked at quite a few visual applications back then, back at Intel when we were starting from the very simple Cocoa data set example uh, that a lot of machine learning people use for training, going all the way to complex uh, medical imaging application. 
they all, the metadata and the connections all look like graphs if you visualize the, the prominent entities and relationships. Furthermore, these are essentially property graphs where uh, nodes and edges or entities and connections have key value properties and can optionally be grouped by classes or tags. Back at Intel, we had built what we uh, call at the time PMGD or persistent memory graph database in order to target um, non-volatile memory or persistent memory that Intel was going to launch. Um, since that particular memory hardware gave us an opportunity to address the traditional disk latencies that were plaguing contemporary graph databases. And, uh, you know, and it was a good demonstration of how you could use the non-volatile memory. That's actually around the time Andy and I met and we were because we were working on two different types of databases targeting the same hardware around similar time frame. Anyway, since non-volatile memory was not, um, not mainstream at the time when we started working, we also introduced durability with DRAM SSD combination. Um, our graph database is asset compliant graph database. Due to its data model, it is very easy to evolve schema uh, for this database by allowing you to add or update any property within nodes or edges at any time, which is really important for visual applications because every time your model gets better, you can extract new information and you want to go back and update your original data. We modeled, um, we modeled its API on, Neo4j was our reference at the time. We were looking at how you can add node, add edge, set the properties and such. And, um, some other API calls. Uh, we also implemented graph traversals, set operations, and tools to manage loading and reading graphs. While our graph library and the API can be used in any application, we have used it within Aperture DB for storing metadata. So the graph API is essentially hidden behind the scenes uh, of, you know, it's, it's behind the native API that Aperture DB exposes to the users. Now, designing a graph database and data structures that go within can be a whole talk by itself on why you chose something, why you didn't choose something. I will just briefly go over some design points here. And of course, when we were building this, we had to be aware of persistent memory characteristics in terms of how it was slower than DRAM, the lower bandwidth, but it would be load store accessible and much faster than disks. So we had to try and maximize benefits of processor caches avoid unnecessary writes, but also get rid of serializing and deserializing code that traditional graph databases actually have to do when they are persisting their uh, data sets to disks. So what we, um, so some of, the, some of the more prominent data structures in our system are like, we allocate fixed size nodes and edge objects that align with cache sizes on top of memory map sparse files that map large physical pages. Now you have to remember all this design started out targeting persistent memory. And some of the stuff has evolved as we have been building and fixing certain things internally. But what I'll talk today is what we built uh, at the time and what's actually open source and available if you want to take a look at it on the Intel Labs GitHub. So we manage the restart, um, you know, so we have persistent memory data structures that are available. The pages are mapped on read write access. We manage the restart by using fixed persistent memory addresses in virtual uh, address space beyond terabyte so that they don't conflict with other applications. At the time, we used um, ext4 file system with uh, direct access extensions. Um, since, a lot of, um, since a lot of cloud systems do not yet have persistent memory, we also introduced msync to disk to support DRAM SSD combination in addition to cache line write backs and um, memory flushes. Intel removed the need at some point to ex do explicit write to persistent memory. And so we just call SFENS in our transactions if we are actually getting to work on a PM-based system. Now, uh, our allocators manage all the non-node or edge space to allocate the properties, indexes, and we have a combination of allocators for um, that are like fixed size for internal data structures and variable size for properties. And there is a third type for large page allocations in, in case you have large blobs as properties. The allocators for fixed size are modeled after JE malloc and for variable size, they're basically our own internal um, algorithm, which I can talk about later if someone is interested. Um, then a lot of the times user queries just want to find the top hundred or thousand results. 
Since it's better to avoid unnecessary accesses, we implemented lazy iterations on finds. Now, you might want to query nodes or edges in a class like person or with a class property combination like person of some age. And that's why we have uh, two level indexes for, for uh, nodes and, and properties uh, and edge, edge class and properties. And there's also an edge index within each node in order to find incoming and outgoing edges very easily based on classes. That also supports fast neighbor traversals, which is one of the big benefits of using a graph database. Undo logging, which is quite similar to right behind logging. That's some, something Andy probably has already talked about. And then finally, uh, we were aiming for billions of nodes and edges, which meant if we used per object locks, we would fill up our DRAM just with lock objects. So we implemented Stripe locks um, that map larger memory area to a lock and use address bits to figure out which of the index to go into for a certain lock. We use, um, we use reader writer logs throughout our implementation. Given the different access patterns of the various data structures, there are different concurrency mechanisms throughout. So for example, if you are trying to get access to an allocator, it means you're primarily going to use it for writes. So we just assign an allocator that's owned by the transaction for the duration. Whereas there are finer grained logs within our tree indexes so that you lock only up to the point that you're going to modify the tree. Um, and like I was saying, there have been some changes uh, over time as we've been fixing for performance, reliability, and any admin uh, tools related stuff. And we can talk about that offline too. Now, I wanted to bring up just this one graph for performance. Um, we kind of ran against time constraints for publishing the paper we were writing on this graph database uh, because, well, I left Intel and the, and when I had time, Intel wasn't ready to publish. And after that, I just, company stuff happened. Uh, so just to give you a quick idea of why we chose PMGD or the persistent memory graph database for our metadata storage instead of going to some uh, other graph database, um, we used, there is, a, there is a benchmark called a social network benchmark provided by LDBC, which is the Linked Data Benchmark Council. And you can tune how many nodes, how many edges it, uh, it simulates. It's modeled on a social network defined by Facebook. Um, it has nine, so the one we used for this evaluation had 99 million nodes and 655 million edges, and there were large properties on each one of those. At the time when we were doing this evaluation, Intel had an emulator which would help you emulate persistent memory characteristics. That's the thing that we used. And comparing it with Neo4j at the time, our query times, sometimes we were 14 times better on very common social network queries using PMGD compared to Neo4j. And even for throughput, uh, like you can see in the graphs here, especially if you're doing a lot of read-only uh, queries, which is very common in the workloads we encounter, this is over 3x improvement compared to Neo4j when we are running with 48 threads on the system. The writes drop the bars a little bit, but there's and, and that's the part we have improved internally within Aperture DB. So this, I, I will leave it at this for the graph database and move to the, the actual data management. So managing the images like, and videos. Yeah. So like for the social media benchmark, like mm -hmm. how much does that look like the workload you're running on the visual data in Aperture DB? So the social network, that evaluation, we did just with the graph database part. So like I said, you could just use that library separately. So we linked, uh, we created, you know, there was a Java based benchmark and we had Java bindings. So we created links from the Java binding to run with PMGD and then, and there were already existing bindings someone had done to Neo4j and we just launched those two separately. So that wasn't in the context of Aperture DB. This evaluation was separate. Uh, my question is like, how much of the queries you want, that customers want to run on the metadata that you're collecting now in the product, do those queries look like what, the, what you showed in the benchmark? Yeah, so those queries actually, yeah, they are in some ways similar because Ultimately, what they what the uh, LDBC queries do is find a person, find all the posts that the person did, and uh, you know count them or something. In in case of you know a retail benchmark, for example, it can be found or find all the products with the label something and find all the images. So they are they simulate that whole find a thing, traverse neighbors. In that sense, they are similar. Of course, then you have to go access the image and it changes the numbers. All right. 
So the visual compute module, it manages the data itself, images, videos, feature vectors. Storage can be on file system or on an object store like S3 or Google Cloud Storage. We support different image and video formats and encodings typically using OpenCV or FFmpeg. Uh, we have implemented some of our own functions too, but we try to reuse um, because these libraries are very optimized to the architecture we run on. We can use the metadata in tandem with, the, with videos to index keyframes, and that helps us enable faster sub-video access. This module also expresses, uh, it also exposes API for pre-processing operations. So this is where we support the resize, rotate, sample, and, and dealing with different encodings and containers and formats. Um, so this is the module that essentially encapsulates all that data operation. Now, an increasingly useful and machine learning driven feature is the support for in indexing feature vectors or descriptors that describe an image or a frame or a, or a bounding box within them. Now, these descriptors, in case of visual data, are typically extracted with using some later stage of a neural network. Uh, so we support different indexing techniques that trade off accuracy and speed of searching by introducing persistence in Facebook's face library uh, indexes, and we support some of our own sparse and dense indexing formats. Uh, the visual compute module then exposes functions to find uh, k near neighbors in a dimension agnostic manner. So you can use, you know, so the way our customers use this is they'll sometimes have 64 dimensional feature vectors, sometimes 128, and they'll use the different, um, you know, they'll index them differently and try to find which distance metric works better, which method of extracting embedding works better. They can do all that stuff. Uh, and the feature vectors also have a representation in our metadata graph. So imagine each feature vector that you extract is connected to what it represents. And then you can use that to find, like find me the closest matches and then go find the actual images or bounding boxes that that belong to. So that can, you know, that can be another way of filtering and finding the data. So that's kind of like the salient points on the visual com uh, compute mo module. The next one, is, and, and you know, something that ties all these components together is the query engine or the orchestrator, or, or you can call it the Apache DB server. It provides, uh, it is a classic concurrent server. It's responsible for providing transactional guarantees across not just you know, the metadata that's handled by the graph, but also any visual objects like images, descriptors, or videos that you send as part of a query to Apache DB. These those guarantees are enforced by the by the server. It's also responsible for um, caching data as required, especially if you're accessing some slower media, especially if the data lives on some slower media. Uh, we also support batching API. So what you can do is multiple clients in parallel can launch a search, but only want parts of that data to operate on, which is very co common for training work training workloads. And so we support that. And this the query engine is responsible for caching uh, the next batches and returning them as required. It also implements role-based access control. It's also responsible for logging, monitoring information. That's where we also enforce API validation and enforce any types. And this is where we support error handling. So there's a lot of logic that goes into this, but a lot of this stuff is pretty well known in uh, database community. So what I want to uh, talk about here are what makes our query engine different. And that's this notion of visual first, JSON API that we've defined. We were faced with the choice of, do we try to use SQL? Do we try to use graph query language? But what we realized is we wanted to support not just metadata, but operations. And all of these things kind of pointed us towards using JSON and defining our own API. So user applications, typically Python based or C++ if needed, don't really see any of the components we talked about before. They just interact with this engine through the Visual First API, a sample of which is shown here. So if you look at this, you can actually, this, this is a fine image command where you put metadata constraint and it actually returns you the image as well. So you can use one command to represent not just the image, but also the metadata describing it. Um, another, just to show how we make use of this is like you can not only apply constraints, but you can apply these operations as you're accessing. And then the JSON API takes care, uh, in the server takes care of finding the right image, 
applying those operations and returning the image in the process format to you. It does the operations on the fly near the data and we'll see the performance benefits from it. Um, and you know, if you go on uh, our documentation page, you'll see the JSON API supports add, find, update, remove for application entities, videos, images, feature vectors, bounding boxes, and any relationships among those. Overall, we've now introduced APIs at varying levels of complexities for our different users in combination with the, uh, in, in, in tandem with the query engine and the, the client modules. So we have our native API, but the Python and C++ connectors help us build object mapper API, which is kind of similar to SQL Alchemy. And then we have a REST API for the web, web, web access. Let's now switch gears to what our design decisions give us in terms of performance. So some of the common queries when say creating training data sets, they involve searching for some keywords or labels from metadata, finding the associated images and processing or augmenting them before training a model. That's what we've been talking about all this time. Um, all these operations are offered by ApertureDB through its unified API, which is also true for the open source precursor of ApertureDB that we started with, which, was, which we called it VDMS or Visual Data Management System back when we were at Intel. So the numbers I've picked up here today to show you are from our recently published VLDB paper from last year. And in the end, I'll, I'll share a link. Um, so th these numbers are from VDMS and we've actually made the performance even better over time. Um, so anyway, in order to compare at least some of the features um, that uh, to a DIY system that we've heard people say or built today, we set up our own parallel DIY system where the metadata searches were supported by Postgres, images were served through Apache web server, and they were processed into the right format using OpenCV, which is a very popular image processing library. We evaluated our representative queries on both the systems using the Yahoo Flickr Creative Commons data set, which has around 100 million images and videos, which is a pretty commonly occurring scale. It represents a wide set of workloads that we have encountered in uh, industry. We were up to 35 times faster, depending on query complexity, and 15 times faster on average. And I'll try to break down some of the benefits and where they come from, but the paper goes a lot more into detail on how we do in terms of database size, how we do in terms of comparing to MySQL, where are the benefits coming from, and some variations on the different queries. Um, so earlier we showed you a comparison of a graph database against Neo4j, which is another graph database. But we also have some examples of how our metadata searches, especially since this metadata is connected in nature, are better supported by our in-memory graph database, where you no longer have to do joins on the queries. So the queries I highlight here, so the red uh, line boxes, they do not involve pre-processing. So the benefits are not coming because you are saving when you pre-process data near where it lives versus where you fetch it to the client. Here it's just filter by metadata constraint and return images as is. So the, so the queries that I highlight here, they just do a filter by metadata and return the images. So when compared to so this is with respect to Postgres, we see orders of magnitude improvement when using 56 concurrent threads for queries. And at the bottom, it's how the queries vary as the database size increases. So when we get to the 100 million images, what happens versus when we started? And then there are different query combinations. I don't have time to get into those, but the paper describes all of these queries and what each of these numbers mean. Since we can perform, so we were just talking about pre-processing near data because our API gives you the option to specify pre-processing operations, you can do that pre-processing near the storage location rather than bring data to the client and then apply the pre-processing. Frequently, given the nature of these workloads, what ends up happening is there is a high resolution data sitting somewhere in storage. You have to fetch it to the client and then reduce it to a very low resolution because that's as much as the neural network can accept. So what we have seen is because we can specify those operations and perform them near data, we can get sizable reduction in network usage because the common case is high res storage to low res neural network or thumbnail displays. So basically, because of the design decisions and how we have combined different things and implemented these things, Aperture DB can be very high performance so that the data pipelines don't, don't become a bottleneck in the whole machine learning setup. 
there are some other um, metrics that we have also evaluated over time. These are using some of our customer benchmarks. Um, so one of them is like, you know, how easy or difficult is it to use, create something like this. So one of the customers, what they told us was building a system to store their images, metadata, and feature vectors, even trying to use some off-the-shelf components would have cost them at least six to nine months for the API that they wanted to expose. And using Aperture DB, they were able to create significantly simpler machine learning pipelines for their overall task and just focus on the machine learning side of their problem that they needed to solve. Using uh, the, this customer's data, we have also tested Aperture DB for a scale of over a billion metadata entities and over and as many relationships among those entities and over 300 million images. And we don't even know if that's like, we haven't tested it to its limits because you, it keeps scaling with the resources you provision behind. So that's kind of what I have on terms of performance. And, you know, we can discuss more in depth, uh, but I wanted to talk more about where we are going next. Ever since we started developing this technology four years ago at Intel, or five years now, uh, all of our focus was on creating an awesome database core since users would be entrusting us with their data and we want to ensure reliability and performance of this data access. Now that the core technology is solid and getting traction, we have been focusing on usability because we want to make it accessible for people across an organization without them having to learn query API specifics and worry about transactional semantics and things like that. Um, so, you know, and we also want to do this part together with user feedback as much as we can. And that's why, you know, it's really great to be able to work on these things as we work with customers. That's why over the course of next year, we'll be enriching um, our object mapper layer. We'll be adding more uh, enhancements to our UI. Uh, in terms of machine learning side, we'll be introducing more integrations. We work with PyTorch. We almost work with TensorFlow. So we'll keep enhancing that and work with more frameworks. We are also introducing other features like complex regions of interest. So right now we can support bounding boxes, we can support, um, we can support storage and retrieval of polygons, but there are other complex APIs that we can do with polygon uh, regions of interest. We are working on um, weighted similarity search. Uh, there are also some database features like introducing user-defined functions um, to execute near the data. There are caching and query optimizations. Of course, cloud scale, keeping everything transparent to the user so that they can keep uh, working with the system uh, while we scale underneath. And then there are, you know, our customers provide some really great feedback in terms of the API that they would like to see. And so that also is a significant enhancement, uh, source of enhancement that uh, we put in our roadmap. Now, part of our journey and growth is also related to our transition from researchers to entrepreneurs. A lot of the learnings have been on how to approach, understand, and work with our users to build a product that really simplifies their lives and gives us plenty of technical challenges to keep us occupied for a while. So um, if you have some, if you have cool ideas, you want to develop on this system, or you want to deploy it, please write to us. Um, that's the email. And if you scan that QR code, it'll give you some other links. I found this really cool on uh, some of the other speakers. So I kind of borrowed that idea. But that's, I'm ready for questions. Awesome, thank you, Peter. I, I'll applaud that, everyone else. Um, so we, let's open the floor to questions. Uh, we have plenty of time. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious what it would take to like deploy a GPU model with just a basic PyTorch ResNet image classifier using Aperture DB, what would that look like? If you're talking about a GPU optimized model, it's something probably that PyTorch would handle. Um, and you know, if you have a machine that is provisioned with a GPU, uh, the data side would still work the same with Aperture DB. If you're asking if could we optimize some of the functions on the GPU ourselves? No, no, not that. Okay. No. Um, so basically, what would get stored? Like, what's the difference between your supporting the OpenCV workload and supporting a GPU-based workload? Do you have like benchmarks for that, or is we the don't different? yet. 
we don't yet have benchmarks for that. Um, we are we have we have we have had plans for you know exploring okay how can we optimize some of the operations using other libraries and perhaps using gpus we haven't gotten there yet okay so the benchmark that you ran with opencv running that is like all within aperture db is that right Yes. So uh, we were supporting pre-processing operations in that case. So the model implementation, so PyTorch was running outside in that particular example. It was accessing data that was stored and searched using Aperture DB. Uh, and what we use OpenCV was for, let's say, resizing the images to the pixel size or dimensions that um, the AlexNet model in that example used. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Thank you. So it, right now, what happens is, let's say you have, you know, you can, you, you have to use PyTorch functions or something to change your data or augment your data. What we are saying is you can offload some of those functionalities to Aperture DB so that let's say if all you're going to do is fetch a high res image and then reduce its resolution after tra making it travel, travel the network, you don't have to do that anymore. You can offload some of those functions to Aperture DB because we support a lot of the pre-processing and augmentation that's common across different applications. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe this is what I meant. Like, so you're not actually running the full PyTorch program. You just... We don't do it internally. No, it's not. Okay. It's not like you can specify run PyTorch in our API. You yeah. use our API to create the data set that gets fed into PyTorch and use it. Got it. And of course, which means these like, yeah, so you, so you push down some like constraints or some filtering so that what gets fed into the Jupyter notebook for this running PyTorch uh, exactly. is, a, you know, a, a somewhat prepared version of the data set, even though PyTorch has to do all of the heavy sort of crunching. So the machine learning side of the crunching, yeah. So if I, if I show yeah. you, uh, I can show you an example since we have some time. Um, so, you know, normally what would happen is, um, so we have this, this is a JSON-based example, right? And we've just used a simple classifier because the point was to show the data side of it. Um, and in here, just the complexity of storing the bounding box, being able to search with it, finding the image that it relates to, that's the part we have addressed from the data management perspective. And that's what gets missed because a lot of the conversation, you're right, is centered around, you know, it's hard to configure machine learning models, it's hard to monitor what they're doing. That's a whole area and body of work by itself. But then there's all this complexity on the data management side, which it's just like, you just pay that price because you don't think about it as actively. And that's where we've realized that you actually do end up spending this price, paying this price repeatedly. Because you do that, you know, even after you've trained the model, now you train it with, you fetch different images, different from different sources, and you keep paying the data engineering price multiple times. And so here, if you see, um, we connected the database, we find, let's say here, we want to train with, um, you know, pictures that contain horses. Uh, we take that and we just create that data set. And PyTorch has this notion of data sets defined. And then behind the scenes, um, fetching things in parallel, batching them, accessing them, uh, you know, as the next stage starts, all that is taken care of by our tool. But the training part or the classifying part, that's still the model and PyTorch runs that part. Uh, to follow, follow up on that. So if I wanted to deploy a new model, mm -hmm. how would that work? It would, I deploy a new model, run it over all the data in Aperture DB, and then have a duplicate set that with some differences uh, between the two models, uh, how would I then disambiguate my Aperture DB query over the results of those two models? So, you know, one of the, actually that's, that's one of the ways um, our customers have kind of been using the metadata part to their great advantage. And we are actually thinking of adding a data set API um, is you can, um, you can actually create an entity or a node called model and connect it to the data that you used. And our edges allow you to put properties on them. So you can indicate you know, any properties of the model that you want to capture. And then you can have another similar entity and then the queries will tell you which data did the models run on or what were they trained on. And if you use the model for classification, those edges is where you could store the accuracy of your classification and you can find things like um, which model classified the same data with a higher accuracy. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. 
your customers want you to run the PyTorch stuff for them or no? They have their own PyTorch stuff. So they are happy that we okay. gave them the data set. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is obviously not a space that I, that I know a lot about. Um, do your customers ever ask you to support like, like I guess, because could Aperture DB connect to like an existing dam? Like I'm thinking like Island Dora is the one I'm, I'm probably most familiar with in like for like digital asset management. I was like, do you see yourself? I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but like there are, you know, because they're, but they are starting metadata. Yeah. So we actually, <laughs> that was one of the design discussions when we deployed this at, at the customer example, I, um, I talked earlier, they, they had their images living in an asset management system, which wouldn't allow them all these functions. Like, you know, data scientists, they want to be able to go put new embeddings and to come up with new um, classifications. So you can, it's not easy to modify asset management system because they're very tied into a certain uh, image storage and very marketing oriented rather than data science oriented. So their question was, can you put a link in the metadata into the images that are stored there and access from there? But ultimately the, the choice became like, okay, what's going to be faster? Is it easier to just replicate and then store it in the data managed by Aperture DB or should we access and um, in, in their case, that performance of accessing was more important than having to replicate. So that's the choice they made. We have, um, we do have use cases where we have to link directly into something that's living in cloud buckets, but that's fine. We can we we, we can support that. Cloud buckets are that's where the data is. So the, the images yes. are. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's expected. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I mean, I, you, this goes back to the conversation you had, you know, I had a while many years ago. But like, it seems like the I mean, as you said, the usability part is sort of the most important thing. And the what's underneath the covers of the database system itself, the, that's all abstracted away because it's hidden from the developer. They, you, you have this API of this orchestrator. They, they don't actually see what's under, underneath. Um, so it, it, like how um, complete is the, the underlying graph database uh, right now, or do, are you spending your time building that thing or the thing up above, like the orchestrator, the, the API, the usability stuff that the, the users actually see? Most of the work in the last year has been on the top. Like occasionally yes. we have something, you know, we have to enhance the graph database because, well, oh, this is a different scale of concurrency that we see. Can we handle it well? Or we need a different tool to understand what's happening or migrate something. But a mm -hmm. lot of the enhancements have been on that query engine layer because, you know, building the role-based access control, all the logging and monitoring support, all that stuff went above. The metadata part has mostly remained stable over time. Oh. I see we'll have you know, we'll have more and more work as we scale out. Um, and that's part of something that I'm, you know, looking forward to in the, uh, in the product roadmap, for sure. Yeah, don't be wrong. That, that's, from a system standpoint, that's fun. But from a startup standpoint, like, if you make the underlying graph database better, like, you know, like, the customer really doesn't see that. You no. know what I mean? If you, so I feel like the, the effort should be up above. You know, so yeah, I mean, the, the work that we have been, that's why the, a lot of the work we've done has been on the top. And plus, you know, like we were talking earlier before the, before the presentation started, there is an underlying expectation that stuff will just work. But what matters is that the API, and that's why we build this web front end, we are creating this Python object layer because that's what the customers interact with. But underlying, they just expect, oh yeah, if we put 50 million images or 100 million images and 300 million entities in the graph, that'll just work. And that's why for us behind the scenes, then we have to make sure that it you know, keeps scaling and what are the limits to the scaling. And that's why you know, we have evaluated to like the billion entities, those many connections so that we can keep we can keep scaling before the customers get there. But like, would you be better served just switching to like Snowflake or something, right? That like, because they'll make their system better and you just get all that for free. I mean, free in quotes, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, we do. I mean, you know, right now the data model that we chose, the reason we chose the graph database that was very much like, you know, we did look at what our alternatives were and would they, fit as easily? Would they make sense? Would we have to contort ourselves a lot to make the uh, metadata fit in that structure, the data work in that way? 
over time, if it so happens that, okay, you know, scaling the scaling, our own system components is just so much more work than using something we'll have to evaluate on, like, you know, we do internal performance evaluation and make sure that the components we are using are really the most suitable components for the workloads. All right, any other questions from the audience? Uh, I got one more last one, uh, Go if that's for all right. It. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you mentioned about how scaling up to like 100 million images is, you know, just works. Um, I'm curious, uh, having worked on vision teams before, oftentimes you'll end up with 20, many, potentially many more different uh, developers working on different models that mm -hmm. actually do different tasks with different, uh, maybe non coco metadata formats. Uh, how would your, what would the data management look like in this graph representation? And what would the queries begin to look like when you start having to add nodes to manage all these things? You know, so in some ways, the the if you look at the property graph model per se, you can introduce any type of application level entities and it just keeps, like you can just keep adding your own classes. That's kind of what, uh, even now in our deployments, it's not just one team or one data science users, it's usually teams. And some teams are focused on um, adding new annotations and training with, you know, annotation-based queries. Sometimes they are adding new models and evaluating models. Sometimes they introduce new products and introduce those connections. So it can keep growing and it supports all those. So sometimes they bring in public data set. So, you know, there are images from Coco and they'll just indicate it with the property name or indicated on the edge key value property. Um, there are different ways. And then we work with our customers on like, okay, this is the best way. These are the indexes you can build. This is, this is what will simplify your query. Um, that's the kind of things we can do. And it just, um, the, the model, the data model just supports adding any different types, any number of different types of entities and connection types. 